So please introduce yourself and what's your name, what are you doing, and where are you at the moment? So my name is Naveen, and uh, that's my older brother Ashok. And uh, it's three of us that run the farm together. So it's, it's my brother Ashok, me, and another cousin of mine, Kamlesh. He should be popping in soon. So three of us run the farms. We run uh, seven farms in total, in, of which Bison Valley is one of the farms. And uh, so right now we're in our testing lab facility. This is where we do a little bit of coffee work, a little sample roaster, just all the different brewing kits and just a little bit of all the different samples that we do. I think there's some of Bison Valley there too. Nice. So, yeah, so we're situated in uh, Tamil Nadu in South of India. And the name of the hills are the Chevroy Hills. So we are fifth generation farmers. So we've been around, we've been here on these farms for the last hundred years. And we're currently the fifth generation and the next, the next team is coming up soon, yeah. The Rajas family have been in coffee since the early 19th century, so approximately around 1915 or 16. My ancestors were basically coffee traders who, basically, who then bought over the farms around 100 years ago. And uh, in total, there's about, there's a whole lot of us running coffees. So in, amongst the large family, we are running it together. So that's basically the big boss for all of us is my dad, the one whose picture you had on the packets last year. Uh, dad basically oversees the whole thing. So we do the physical day-to-day -day running of the farms. So amongst us, I handle uh, the sales and marketing and basically the clean coffee part, the division of it. And uh, the day-to-day -day running is shared between my brother Ashok, my cousin Kamalesh, and uh, some parts are taken care of by me. So between us, we run the whole operation together. And dad's always there for guidance on the top. So he's been in coffee for the longest. So a little background about us is I got back to the farm. I think this is the, one of the later questions. So I got back to the farm in 2014. I was working as a lawyer in Sydney before that and in New Zealand before that, yeah. So Ashok was in the US and working in uh, human resources for about 19 years. So he got back in 2016. And my cousin Kamlesh was working as a banker in the UK and he got back in 2012. So we got a little mixed backgrounds, corporate backgrounds. And I mean, we all grew up here on the farm till we're 18, so this is in the blood. Went out, got a little bit of worldly exposure, tried all the different beers around the world, yeah, and just got back here, kind of. <laughs> yeah. So, so a little bit about us is, so we got back to the farm in, uh, I mean, over the last 10 years, and we were doing purely commercial coffees because dad was running it on his own, and he had his own trading, coffee trading business. So he was basically had his hands full of everything else. And so we came back, it's when, when I came back in 2014 it was my cousin Kamlesh and I sat together and said, uh, now that we have more manpower to actually look into this, let's move into specialty and try working our way up through specialty coffees. So it was a huge expensive learning process the first two years, because what we did was we had a thousand acres between the seven farms, 1000 acres. So we had to split them up into fields, zones, and all of us have, I mean, corporate backgrounds and obsessive spreadsheets and I mean, attention to detail is what we really want to work with. We don't want to leave anything to chance. So we basically split the estate into blocks based on elevation, soil type, shade patterns, my, your intercrop and uh, soil types and soil nutrition. So we split the estate into blocks of these. So now we know exactly, for example, Bison Valley Selection 9 if you're taking one batch of selection nine and then you want something else to match that, we can match it with another estate which has similar soil, another block, similar soil, similar elevation, similar slope, similar intercrop and shade. So we did a lot of that over two years, got all the coffees cupped, which was an intense long process. So we had every field cupped by multiple people to get the basic notes ready. So we know when you're mixing and matching and combining two batches, we know what we can mix and match. So it took us a little while to get that going. And uh, 
a lot of time to get our staff trained because our staff were used to basically getting coffees, bulking it, washing it, and then packing it up. And it was instead of doing one round of coffee, like every season now we have approximately 700 different boxes of coffee on the yards. So 700 different bags, I mean, boxes of coffee get tracked from the day it gets harvested. So I've, got, I've actually got a Bison Valley sample. So that's something like, a, I don't know if you can see that. Might be glaring. So we have, so every, every bag of coffee that goes into the warehouse comes out of the one kilo sample that come gets, gets cupped here at the lab. So we split them by estate wise, field wise, lot numbers. So it's, so we, we go through about 700 samples every season. So probably just buzzing all the time on cafe in here. <laughs> so that's something we do. We enjoy coffee more than anything else. Three of us really enjoy our coffees. So we enjoy doing the cupping. So every day, each one is spoiled for choice. They get freshly roasted coffees every day. So easy way to keep coffees moving here. So all of us just keep trying our new coffees. Like he's kind of spoiled. He doesn't want coffee that's more than two days old. <laughs> yeah. So he comes to the lab and he's like, what's the latest one? I said, God, that's three days. Like, no, nah, I don't want three days here. So, I mean, I mean, we can afford to get fussy because there are lots of coffees coming in daily. So, uh, so Bison Valley Estate as such is one portion of the estate, which is an individual, it's about 80 acres in total, Bison Valley. And uh, Bison Valley was named Bison Valley by my dad because it's always full of bison. So it's actually named because of bison. So you can be sure if you walk into Bison Valley Estate, you're, you are going to run into bison. And uh, I'll try and get some videos for you. We have some older footage of bison hanging around there, but we're getting some fresh footage here. So you guys I want your to... dad's YouTube channel, by the way, and he has bi bison footage on it. That's it. Okay, there you go. He loves his bison. Yeah, he's always he's always running around there, driving and chasing them out. So to give you an example, we used to get approximately one or two bison a year. So 25 years ago, today we get approximately 40 bison a day. So that's so. So from, from, from being something unique, it's becoming more of a pest, but we've got to live with them one way or the other, yeah. So that's the history behind Bison Valley Estate and uh, the bison. So yes, there are actual bisons that run around Bison Valley Estate. And uh, bison don't really damage our coffee crop other than when they're walking through, they damage plants. Primarily, they, they like eating oranges. So we grow a lot of oranges as intercrop. At least we used to grow them before the bison ate them. So, they like the fresh leaves on the top of the orange tree. So what the bison does is each bison is approximately 1,500 kilos in weight. So he just leans on the tree, snaps the orange tree, has a little nibble for three, four minutes, moves on to the next tree. That takes you another 10 years to grow your orange tree back. Yeah. So, so that, that's the little history behind the bison. So it's more of a love-hate relationship between us and the bison, but that's something we've got to keep up with. So about, about the uh, processes we do, so what we do is we have a few standard processes that we follow for all the estates, depending on what we've cupped them before. So we've cupped all the coffees earlier and seen that yes, this coffee works well as a washed or works well as a honey or works well as a natural. And uh, so every year we have a few preset processes based on pre-orders. And we also do three to four experiments every year. So we run three to four experiments every year, which we cup for our own personal interests. And if anything works out well, we try and implement that on a larger scale based on the feasibility, then the actual process of doing it, if it's practical to do it. Like we've done a certain real unique processes like a cascara fermentation, where we get coffee eating, we, we brew cascara over four days, then we soak the coffee in cascara and then do so. It's fantastic coffee, but just not worth the time or the effort. Yeah. Coffee fermentation side, we do a lot of different kinds of fermentation. So we do, uh, so just like this year's processes, we've got uh, the dry fermentation, depends on different hours. So we've got, see our coffee goes from, we have certain farms, certain fields, which are a thousand meters above sea level. Certain farms, certain fields were up to 1,500 meters above sea level. So because of the range, we can't use one standard method for all. So when I say dry fermentation, 24 hours, it might work for a field at 500 meters, 
whereas it may not work for a field a thousand five hundred meters because it's much denser beans. The climate's different. The weather's different. We have like a fourteen degree difference in. We have a lot of microclimates here. So basically, between where I stay here near the lab, and my brother stays six kilometers from here, we have like a seven degree temperature difference. So he runs in a he lives in a whole different microclimate. I live in a different microclimate, though we're just ten kilometers apart. So that's one of the things about living in the hills with ups and downs. So we have a whole lot of processes. This year, for example, we're doing. I'm talking about the larger processes. We're doing. A, we do a papaya fermentation. We do a pineapple fermentation. And then we do orange fermentation. Then we do lactic. It's basically milk. We do a lactic and a brown sugar, country brown sugar for our washed. And then we do several anaerobics. So we do anaerobic 36 hours. We do an anaerobic 96 hours. So again, depends on what people are after. So my, on the farm side of it, we don't get into the depth of if I'm tasting mandarins or raspberries in the final. But we have a different scale of operating where we have like good and really good coffees. And so in, in our opinion, basically, the minute you go for a super ripe coffee, like a 24 bricks while harvesting, that's when the sugars are completely formed on the coffee bean. And then you do an anaerobic, you go more, more towards dark fruits. So you get more of a jammy, mixed fruit kind of jam kind of flavors in your cup, which works better. What we've seen is in markets where they use it as an espresso shot. So it's like a sweeter espresso shot does not work with the Italians at all because they like the little bitterness to it. Whereas the same fruit, if you harvest it slightly earlier, like around 21 bricks or 19 to 21 bricks, then you've got a little mix of acidity and the sweetness at the same time. So we get a lot of people who don't want, do not want acidity at all. They're like, we don't want the acidic coffees. We want the really sweet, jammy, syrupy coffees. So that's a little, little, little mix between them. So that's why we really specif specify that we, we, we work on pre-orders. So normally we get all the coffees ordered by October. So when an order comes in, in October, so for example, if, if for example you tell me next year I want 50 bags of so-and-so coffee, if you tell me in October, what we do is we demarcate a particular field for you. So that way we can replicate every year. So we don't have to do any more calculations. So if I take 50 bags from this field, it's going to so-and-so person. If it's booked, it's picked only for that person. So you get uniqueness and basically you get traceability down to the plant. So we do all our coffees 100% traceable. So we do a lot, put in a lot of work here. So for us, our main thing is we want to be able to replicate what we do. There's no point of us doing it one year and then not able to replicate the next year. So this helps us in replicating when we, and we have exactly the same field. So if I know Bison Valley Estate is 80 acres, so your coffee might be coming from just two fields from the 80 acres. So if I have those two fields, like for now, I need to look into last year's fields, which we supplied in the last, last two years, see if we have the same fields available this year because it's already late in the season. Otherwise, for the next time we can demarcate certain fields. So basically tomorrow when you guys do come down here, which you have to one time or the other, I can show you a lot of advice in here. We can take you to those fields. So for example, if you're gonna bring people who've been, who've liked the coffee from your cafe, you can bring them down. You can actually go there and have a cupping session in the estate, in the particular field, knowing that this is the coffee that you're being brewing here. So we do, we do work with that. So that's a little bit about our fermentation program. So we do a lot. like. Maybe this year, end of the season, you can sample some of the pineapple and papaya and different fruit fermentations. And that could be something you can think of for next season and we can work together for that for next season. So otherwise, so we do a mix. So we, we, may, not be, we may not have a papaya for Bison Valley this year, but we've done it, I think some in Orchardale and a few of the other estates. So depending on that, we can mix it up and show you what's available. And uh, yeah, that's a little bit about the fermentation. Uh, Bison Valley, we, we got, so then again, it comes down to how we harvest it. So we have, we have an opportunity farm level to manipulate what we want from the flavors. So what we've clearly seen is you pick it early, you're getting more of berries. You're getting more of berries, like whether it's raspberry and uh, stone fruit and the, the more on the berry side of it. Whereas you pick it late, later in the season, which is 20 plus bricks, 21 bricks, you're moving more towards plums and the darker fruits. So we always just judge it by lighter fruits and darker fruits. So we have two kinds of customers, one who want the lighter fruits to make more manual brews for pour overs and things like that. Then we have another group who wants more of the darker, intense mixed fruit, plum, and those kind of flavors in it. So it's just for us, the whole idea on the farm level is 
you either pick the fruits earlier or pick the fruits later. So we're able to, I mean, stretch to both sides of the, uh, of the spectrum and uh, also comes down to processing. So the, the lighter processes, the less anaerobic, the, the more you go into anaerobic and uh, basically any kind of uh, intense starvation process, like any kind of maceration, you're going more towards darker. Whereas the, you go lighter for like a dry fermentation or a less fermenting time, you go more towards lighter, very more lighter fruity notes here. Yeah. That's what we've seen farm levels. So we plan our harvest and bookings based on that. So the end customer, what he liked, like if he liked an anaerobic last year, and that's what he wants again this year. That's what we, we try and keep it up with. Whereas some of them have tried a little bit of both. They like the darker fruits for their, uh, basically for their cold brews and uh, for their espressos. And they go for lighter fruits for their manual brew bars. So we, we, can, we can cater to both. So that's something because here we do a lot of brewing and trials every day so we can see the difference because we get samples that come in November, samples that come in December. So November, the bricks on the plant. So we, we, we really tabulate every single reading. So from daily temperatures to daily bricks to evening temperature, night temperature. So we know because it all plays a part in your fermentation. So we try and match it to match the flavors. So we've seen the difference. So it, 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 make, it helps us plan out what we want to do. So someone's more of the lighter and uh, lighter flavors and more berry-like and the uh, lighter fruits. So we, we, we basically put as lighter fruits and dark fruits here. So the early in the season, lighter fruits, dark fruits later in the season. Same way, open fermentation, dry fermentations are lighter fruits. The minute you go into, uh, I mean, like a anaerobic process or a longer fermentation, you're moving towards darker fruits, yeah. So we, we, we have a big divide here at home based on coffee flavors. So what we've seen generally in India is the older generation want coffee that tastes like coffee, whereas the younger generation want coffee that tastes like oranges and apples and pineapples and stuff. So dad, we, we, we get dad to try the different coffees and he's like, why would you drink coffee if you want to try something that tastes like apples and peaches and get something else? So that's the typical reaction we get from uh, dad and basically all our uncles and stuff at that generation, they want coffee that tastes like coffee. It's really strong. It's got thick body and a little bit of bitterness. That's what they grew up on. So he does appreciate the few newer coffees we make. Like he's like, yep, it tastes different. But so you give him a cup of coffee. He says, oh yeah, this is nice. This is different, but yeah, I'll have my coffee. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's the usual we get. So generally on the farm, he's, uh, I mean, he was impressed that because all our staff have been with us for more than 20 years. Like 20 is the average, probably the lowest someone's worked here. So I think people like us, they like, they, they've been working here for 20. We've got staff who've been here for 40 years and stuff. So we grew up with a lot of the staff around here. So they've been, here. so for them, it's the biggest change because it's 20 years of putting coffee together, drying it out in three days, bagging it and shipping it out. Whereas suddenly now these crazy youngsters have come back and they want to dry coffee for 22 days. And so for two years, they were like, these guys are off their heads, yeah. I can dry the coffee in three days. Some of the staff will say, sir, we just, we'll dry it in three days. Like, nah, I want to dry it over 20 days. So you put it there, you cover it, you open it at 11 o'clock in the morning, cover it back at three in the afternoon. And then, so, so what we did is we, we started running a little competition between our staff. So since we run seven different farms, so between the seven farms, every year we give them a big bonus on which farm is selling more coffee which farm has got a higher score, cup score. So which farm has done better, which farm has got a better I mean, increase in yield. So based on such things, we give them a, a, a bonus and they, they get a gift every year. So now there's a little bit of friendly rivalry going on. So even between fermentations, the so one staff who runs one particular farm and says, these guys did the papaya last year. Can we do papaya with so-and-so batch? Because it's quite similar. Can we try it here, this and that? So it creates a nice healthy, healthy interaction between them. We get them to try their coffees. So we get them to come here and try all the coffees. So I have the same thing. Yeah. A, a, a lot of things doesn't make sense for them. So when we came back here, we decided that on a, on a personal basis, we decided that we'll stop using weedicide completely. So we've made our estates completely weedicide and pesticide free. So we haven't gone for organic certification, but then we just decided more on a health basis because from where we lived and worked, we said there'd be no more weedicide used here. So we came back here and we stopped weedicide in, in 2013. 
So all of a sudden, the farms got weeds almost the height of coffee. So my dad's generation, they've only seen farms which are neat, clean. So basically, you had the coffee plants and the bottom was clean because it's just like one round of weedy side and then there's no weeds there. So for him, it took a long time. He said, you guys are crazy. You guys are ruining it. 40 years of my hard work, you guys is ruining in two years. But then what we noticed was, yes, the first year we took a massive hit in the crop because the weeds were catching up. Then after the weeds caught up, we noticed the cups, the cups go started increasing. So we don't, we haven't yet got a link between what weeds and why it increased in the scores. But in general, we noticed the number of earthworms have increased, the whole the amount of bees and the birds have increased and the cups are definitely increasing here. Yeah. The scores have been increasing annually. I mean, that's also thanks to our processing, but then to some level, I think it's, it's the weeds contributing because the amount of breakdown from the weeds. So we've seen nowadays, we get visitors from Europe and from uh, uh, Japan and stuff. And then they come here and they're like, wow, finally an estate with weeds. It, it feels natural. Otherwise every other farm was like neat and clean and manicured, which is not possible without weed aside, yeah. So that's, that's, that's a huge change again for that generation. Yeah. So the, the biggest challenge we are facing is uh, nature, the weather. So we've got rainfall records for the last 55 to 60 years on the farm. And we've seen the rainfall has moved by almost 50 days. So it's, it's later by 50 days, which means your flowering is 50 days later, your harvest is 50 days later, and everything is it's slowly changing. So what happens here is it, it, it overlaps other, other periods, for example, in India, there are about six coffee growing regions. So Chikmangalore is like one of the most famous coffee growing regions. They get their crop in November, December. For us, whereas in the Chevrolet where we live, we're still harvesting in March when, when they're already loading the ships on their crop. So we were always the one that was left out. But then we've turned that into an advantage because now people have finished filling the shopping bags with Chikmangalore coffee and they come back for the round two and then come to the Chevrolet. So that, that's helped us. Another thing is uh, untimely rainfall. So because of that, now suddenly if we get rainfall in between, like what's happened is this year we've had our worst rainfall. I mean, the I mean the highest amount of rainfall, especially during the crop time. So we've had 17 days of rain in December. We've had 21 days of rain in January. So we're estimating we've dropped 40% of our crop. So what happens, your crop is fully ripe. You get rainfall, the, the beans burst, drops on the ground. So this year we've had the worst, our worst hit years this year. So we explained, we estimated we've dropped about 40% of our produce this year, which is not just here, but all over India in general, because we had a lot of late rains. So we're expecting about 40% down. So that's basically 40% of coffee, which goes into commercial coffee again for us. But that's a huge uh, drawback. So nature, rainfall, and then prices. What happens is here is every three months, the government raises the minimum wage. So every three months, your minimum wage goes up, your fuel price goes up, coffee price is still sitting what it was in 1996 for commercial coffees. So for example, a commercial coffee prices, the commodity market for coffee is exactly the same price you had in 1994. But then your living wage and the wages you're paying the farm is based on 2021. So there's no parity at all. That is one of the major regions uh, reasons why we got into specialty coffee to, to try and bridge the gap which in in in, in common sense it doesn't it, even today's specialty prices you don't bridge the gap you basically cut your losses so that's why coffee farms intercrop a lot so we depend a lot on timber we depend a lot on oranges we do a lot of pepper we grow pepper as an intercrop so all these pay a pay uh, i mean they pay, play their part in uh, keeping your prices to at least sustainable levels so in my opinion, and in general, if you look around here, coffee farming is not going to be sustainable. As a, It's not going to be profitable. Definitely not Arabica. So at least Robusta, your costs of input are less. 
So a lot of Robusta, I mean, a lot of Arabica farms are basically uprooting the Arabica, moving to Robusta because it makes more sense to grow Robusta. Because you think about prices, rising prices, changing weather patterns. We feel the effects of global warming firsthand. Like your rain comes in three weeks later, you're affecting a whole cycle. Your rain comes three weeks early, you're, you're, you're changing the cycle. So basically you're putting in one year's work. For example, this year, we, we put money into our fertilizer, we put money into our processing, into our shade, all the farming practices. And you come there to harvest and there's heavy rain for 40 days, your crop is in the ground. So it's basically, you put, you invest the money for nine months and then in two months, it just, it, it just rains you out completely. So it's going to take you another nine months to come back because a farmer earns it only once. You get a crop once a year. So you have one income a year. So you get an income in January or February. That money should last you till the next January or February. So you've got to plan your budgets. So yes, you can plan your budgets, but you can't plan the weather. So that's the biggest. So like, for example, for us, we had everything ongoing. We're expecting a large crop this year. We had rain nonstop. We, we, you've got to just sit and watch the rain. So you dropped completely in December. Then yes, we started picking. We started harvesting December 20th. Jan, I mean, December 29th, the rains came back. It rained nonstop for 19 days up until Jan 17th. So all our specialty crop was on the ground. Then we said, okay, fine, get back up, start moving again. We started harvesting again. Two weekends ago, we had four days of nonstop heavy rain. So all the remaining produce on the plant further dropped. So you, you can get wiped out in a year. So you have to try and balance it out, have intercrops have another source of income. Primarily, you're dependent on farms. It's not going to make it at all. Like, so for us, on, on, a, on a large farm, for us running large farms, it's, you're, you're, you're barely trying to bridge the gap. You're not even kind of breaking even. So over the years, you've got to keep increasing, do a little more intercropping, think of other aspects. So that's it. So we try and support the local farms here. So we, we employ people locally. So everyone who works with us basically has their own little farm around here, two or three acres. So we try and purchase their crop, use their crop also for our, some of our special specialty batches or larger commercial batches. So we try and keep them engaged, keep them, into, I mean, keep, keep them along with us, let them sail along with us because they've been working here for the last 35, 40 years. So we, we support them. So it's a little bit of give and take. Yeah, that's one of our biggest challenges. And I, I don't see any, any kind of uh, big boost coming in the future to change that because yes, yeah, specialty can help in a little bit, but there's, there's, there's no kind of solution for, I mean, for what the weather can do because weather patterns are changing. So unless you have some kind of stability, it's going to take a long, long time to balance it out. Yeah. So like we, we've had this discussion, we've had the discussion amongst us, like we've been doing it for five, six years now, specialty coffee. So like for us, we're doing specialty coffee more as a personal interest to us. We're enjoying the journey. We're enjoying the coffee. Yes, we're, we're loving interacting with people, getting people to like our coffees. So we are doing it. But then if you come down to the practical, like even we are experimenting with other crops at the moment, like pepper, growing intensive cultivation of pepper and other crops because that is way more feasible. So yes, we will have coffee, but there might be a time when, so we are running, so for us, what is, we, we do everything in little experimental blocks. So over the years, we have started experimental blocks of growing just black pepper, of growing different kinds of high value fruits. So for us, basically, we're gonna just evaluate and see over three or four year period, if that's gonna make more sense. So what we have to do is maybe, for example, Bison Valley, if it's 80 acres, maybe grow coffee in just 40 acres where you can, you can control the weather where you have enough water to water it if necessary. You can you have the manpower to harvest it or how are you able to control it, fence the whole place, keep the bison out, keep the monkeys out. So protect your crop. At the same time, for the balanced 40 acres, you can do maybe intensive pepper, intensive mangosteen or durian or some other fruit. So you, you can keep it more sustainable. You still have coffee, you still have fruits. That's, that's another option. So. We are evaluating such options. We're taking like basically uh, tried and tested decisions on, on, such, on such aspects. So you keep your risks to the minimum, but at the same time, you have to explore and see if, if it's something feasible or not. So we are working on different feasibilities. So we'll see how it pans out over the next few years. Yeah.